Hey everyone. Welcome to this workshop on rationality and alignment. I'm Ruby. I'm team lead for Less Wrong. I'm also responsible for the infrastructure and code base behind the alignment forum. I joined the rationality and alignment communities about 10 years ago. And since then, I've been very enthusiastic about rationality and pretty concerned about AGI. There's a deep connection between rationality and AI. Both of them are explorations of kind of how minds work and how you can make them work better. But also rationality, I think, is very useful for making plans to cause alignment to be solved. Not that I've ever done it. <laughs> this is not a uh, workshop on technical research. I'm not a technical researcher myself, so that would be a hard talk for me to give. But the material I'm drawing on, mostly coming from Elias Yudkowsky's sequences and somewhat from the Center for Applied Rationality, I think is useful, uh, is useful across kind of all ways you might try and help with alignment, useful for technical research, useful for governance and policy, useful for community and field building, and pretty much anything else. Uh, so that's what I hope to, to demonstrate today. As regards to the structure of this workshop, the first 10 minutes will just be me talking and kind of sharing a simple model for why I think rationality is useful for alignment. And then the second part, where we'll spend most of the time, will be hands-on exercises. That's why we've got lots of pens and papers uh, all around. OK. So I find this uh, a nice little frame to think about problems, particularly the alignment problem. Pretty straightforward, we say, the time it takes to find a solution to a problem is proportional to how many solutions you have to sift through and how good and quick you are at sifting through those solutions. Where sifting through solutions, you know, you could break it down into two parts. One part being, you know, how much and how quickly you're running experiments and trying things. Uh, you know, if you sit in your house all day doing nothing, you're not going to find a solution. Uh, but also, even if you are running lots of experiments, making good use of the data and what you're learning. Uh, and so I think that's another very big part in a lot of what rationality is about. In the context of the alignment problem and understanding why the alignment problem is hard, it's uh, pretty straightforward that the size of the solution space is a lot. There are many possible designs of powerful AIs, and probably only a very small number of them are like friendly and safe. If you imagine that, you know, the, the solution to the alignment problem looks like something like a particular computer program, just, just a lot of possible computer programs. Paired with that, we have this unfortunate fact that we're currently very slow at sifting through AGI solutions. Uh, I think people will, often, people will often talk about how uh, alignment research right now is pre-paradigmatic. I think a lot of what that means is that we don't have a methodology that we know works for kinding towards solutions. Or in another angle, whatever you're trying to do, we don't have much feedback. Feedback's great because you try things and you see what works and what doesn't. But the current situation is if you're doing technical research, be it conceptual or like prosaic ML, you'll probably not find out for many years whether that research was useful in aligning a very powerful AI partly because we don't have AIs that powerful yet, and even if we did, they're too expensive for everyone to get their try to try their ideas on them. If you're doing policy work, probably be many years before any of your policy interventions you know, show up as being useful for causing companies or governments to have good policies, take good actions. If you're doing community or field building, you're another step removed because it'll probably take several years before the people you recruit start doing work, and more years after that to see if the work's any useful. So you could easily end up recruiting people who add more noise than signal to the community. And all that might be fine if we had all the time in the world, except maybe we have all the time in the world and it's not that much. <laughs> it's kind of a race. Uh, we're trying to figure out alignment before the capabilities people figure out capabilities. And they have an easier problem because their solution space is effectively smaller. There are more designs they could hit upon that are very powerful than aligned designs that we have to hit upon. They've also got more of a methodology. Right now, at least, you know, you can add more compute, add more data, you know, more layers in your model, and you'll tend to get more power 
and you can kind of hill climb on that. So it's, it's a tough problem. It's a tough situation. Uh, and my thought on like what we can maybe do about this is look at this denominator and see if we can make it larger. Get better at getting information that gets us towards a solution, both in kind of running useful experiments and making use of them. And I don't think it should be controversial that this is the kind of thing you can do. I think already human thought exists on a spectrum of how, use, how, how good we are at observations, how good we are at using those observations. You know, on one extreme, people just make stuff up. This can be a lot of fun. Not good at finding a particular solution in a large uh, solution space. Moving on from there, we have what I would call regular uh, observation and regular inference. This is what most functioning humans do to get by. It's useful for things like I put my hand on the hot stove, I learn that it hurts me, uh, good inference, good observation, better future life choices. And then, some number of 100 years ago, some humans figured out that you could do better. You could be precise with your investigation, precise with your inference. And then we started figuring out things like the laws of thermodynamics, you know, the laws of electromagnetism. And the modern world is built on humanity going from regular observation to systemic observation. And what I will claim is there's no reason to think that, you know, the modern scientific method as practiced, even ignoring dysfunction of academia, is the limit of what we can do. I think there's like stuff more towards the right. Uh, and like one definition I'll give you for rationality is it's intentionally trying to move rightwards on this graph. Okay. All of that was like high level and abstract and you're like, you know, if you left now, what would you do with it? Which is why we have, this is a workshop and what I want to work on now is like, okay, I think there are a bunch of rationality skills and tools that we do know. We probably know something less than 5% of like what we could know. But what we do know is actually useful. Uh, so here are kind of a few ideas. And for this workshop, uh, I want to be fairly ambitious and try and like touch upon everything in the left column. And this is going to be a bit of whirlwind and it probably won't be satisfying and it's not really enough time. Uh, but for making the case that rationality is useful, I kind of want to give people exposure to a broad set of tools. Okay. Further thought. I think sometimes in practicing rationality tools and ideas, they can feel fairly disconnected from your life and what you're doing and feel a bit like fake. Uh, and for that reason, I thought, well, I, why don't we do this in a context that matters to people? Plans. I expect that everyone in this room, not everyone, most people in this room either have a plan or want to have a plan for causing alignment to be solved. And so I'm going to kind of spring this on you and say, OK, guys, let's think about your plans, and then let's practice some rationality tools in the context of them. Thinking about your plans can be a bit confronting, um, a bit demoralizing when you think, oh, no, my plan isn't that good. This is alignment. No one has a good plan. If anyone had a good plan, I'd be working with them instead of doing what I'm doing. Uh, if you're not in the mood to think about your plan, feel free to like, not do it. Uh, I'm not going to call upon anyone to like talk about their plans or justify them. And if you don't want to share it with anyone else later, you don't have to do that either. Also, I will say that I consider technical research to be a plan. It's a plan that looks something like, I will solve this problem, that will solve that problem, that will solve that problem, that will eventually result in an aligned AI. Um, so like all the other things, governance policy or, or field building or anything else, that too is a plan. And so my first question for you is to write in whatever native format comes to you, you know, however you would like write it for yourself, start by saying, all right, here I am now. What are the steps I'm about to take that then result in alignment being solved? And so I'm going to set a five-minute timer and ask people, please write out your plan as much as you can in five minutes. Go. That's time. I apologize if it's not enough. It's a metaphor for AI alignment. <laughs> Okay, before the next exercise, um, I want to share a mini framework I use to think about plans, or two, two particular properties I think about plans having. The first one is connectedness. A plan is fully connected if there are steps taking you all the way from where you are now to the goal where you want to end up. A plan is partially collected if you only have steps some of the way. For example, a partially connected plan 
might be something like, I'm going to become a technical alignment researcher, I'm going to study AGI safety fundamentals, then I'm going to go to Berkeley and talk to researchers and write on the alignment forum, and then I'll be a technical alignment researcher. And I'm like, okay, and, and, and then what happens? You know, I'm, I'm a technical alignment researcher. <laughs> and this is fine. This is, this is not necessarily a bad plan. Like, this is reasonable. But I think it's important to note that it's not a fully connected plan that gets you all the way from, from where you are to where you want to be. And you probably do want to do a step of checking, hey, does be, becoming a technical alignment researcher lead to the goal I really want? The second property I like to think about plans having, secretly it's the same as the first property, is resolution. A low resolution plan is where you just have kind of like big abstract steps, like become a technical alignment researcher or, or field building or something. A high resolution plan is you're like, I'm going to become a technical researcher and I'm going to work on interpretability and I'm going to work on this particular kind of interpretability that I expect to be useful under this kind of training regime. And it's a complicated plan, and it might fail, but it's specific, and it makes it makes the failures much easier to make much easier to see. I think the 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 low resolution, highly abstract plans kind of stem from the human ability to reason at this high level, which is a pretty great ability, symbolic reasoning, abstract reasoning. But we can just shoot ourselves in the head with it by kind of like pushing around empty labels. I think this is very likely to happen when we get models or ideas or parts of our plans from other people. They might have a lot of detail in what they mean by it. And then you kind of just learn. Uh, people might be familiar with the, the, the story, I think, from Feynman, where Feynman knew what a refractive index was. And the students learned to parrot it in the right places. But then when faced with an actual refractive index, didn't know what to do or couldn't identify it and say, oh, yeah, water is an infract, uh, refractive index. And again, I don't think this, you know, plans can necessarily always have specific detail, but it's worth tracking. Does my plan have that? Oops. This is an older version of the slides before I took that out. But this is Nate Soares talking about all the things that need to go right for alignment to work out. This is his simplified model he's sharing, where he's like, this has to go right, and this has to go right, and this has to go right. And I'm sharing this as an example of what it looks like to have like some higher resolution rather than something like, I don't know, I do research and we figure it out. This is what I think most plans will look like. You'll kind of have some like specific next steps that you have in mind leading up to like a kind of broader idea and then a big gaping hole and then maybe another broader idea towards the end. Again, alignment planning is hard. I don't know of a good plan. But I think we should track, you know, our plans aren't great. Look for where we can shore them up. Look for where we can, like, already predict maybe there's failure. No. Uh, OK, this uh, slide deck is outdated. The slides you have printed out will be the correct one. So the exercise I'd like people to do now is, now that you have this concept of connectedness and resolution to rewrite your plan kind of in, in Ruby's ontology in a way that might highlight any low resolution or lack of connectedness, just so it's easy to track. We'll do another five minutes on this one, and then subsequent exercises are all going to be two or three minutes. For this, one, for this one, I think the, the large pieces of paper are particularly useful, give you more space. Um, so they're kind of distributed around on the tables. Yes. I think the step of like having your small dot now and your small dot at the end of alignment is solved and trying to fill in kind of what happens. Uh, I should say it's okay to implicate other people in your plans. 
Uh, it would be surprising if any single person solved the entire problem single-handedly. Don't let me stop you. But you're fine to say, I will do x, and then other people are going to do y. Uh, that's a fine thing to have in your plan. That's time again. Having sketched out your plan in this circles and dots framework, I'd like you now to look at any of the lower resolution parts of your plan and try to make one of them more specific, higher resolution. If you're feeling bold, you might take one a harder one. If you're like less sure, you could take one where you're like, you're pretty sure you could do it, you just haven't done it yet. You might say, well, it's, it's a high-level abstract step because I might do it in one of five ways and I don't know which one yet I'm going to do. That's fine. Pick one. Uh, part of the exercise of making your plans higher resolution is just to check that there's any conceivable way it could work once you like, break it down. And so what I think what I'd actually do in practice when making plans is take a high-level step and like, try and break it down in multiple ways and hope that you know, one of them will pan out in practice. But the checking is very valuable. So let's do three minutes on that, taking a high-level step in your plan and looking for a way you could make it concrete and specific to happen. OK, the next one is a fun one. Future you comes back and says, your plan failed. Alignment was not solved. Everyone died. They don't tell you why. They don't tell you what went wrong in your plan. But maybe you already know if you think about it. Maybe hidden in your mind is like the little fear of like, oh yeah, that rattling. <laughs> I could have, I could have noticed. Uh, so this, I got this from CIFAR. I think Center for Applied Rationality. I think they got it from somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, but let's try this now. Looking at your plan, saying, is there a step that I already think is maybe more likely to fail than others, and I can identify it? Two minutes for that. Maybe you think that step of your plan could fail, but also maybe it could work. One thing you might do is carry out your entire plan until you get to that step and then see whether it succeeds or fails. Another thing you could do is say, hey, this is the part of my plan that might fail. Can I test that plan quickly? If, you're, if you tend to work in startups, this is kind of why we often build mock-ups and prototypes before building the whole thing. It's an idea of, you know, can I test a key assumption without going to all the effort of, you know, shipping an entire product? And I think this, uh, this approach generalizes to a lot of life. You know, you'll find people who do a four-year medical degree to find out they don't like medicine. And I'm like, did you follow around a doctor for a week? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, you, you could have saved yourself four years. I think this also goes for alignment. And again, because alignment doesn't give you feedback, uh, you could, you know, wait five years and turns out your approach wasn't good. And so where possible, hunt for ways to like quickly test things, quickly test assumptions. And so this is our next exercise, two minutes to think of some step in your plan that you don't know if it'll work, but you can maybe test it faster than just carrying out your entire plan. On to the next one. We have about 10 minutes left of exercises, more than halfway done, so getting there. Sometimes we form plans. We think a lot. We have a period of like going in our lives and we're like, all right, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. And you intensely think about it and you talk to a lot of people and you make a plan. And then you hold on to that plan for quite a while, uh, even when new information has come in. In fact, this holds on generally to beliefs. Often we form beliefs. And even though new information has come in that should make us change our minds, we don't. This can be because of attachments. You know, We want to believe a certain thing. But also it can just be because human brains are finite. And every time we learn something new, we don't automatically you know, recheck all of our million beliefs and update them. And that makes it worthwhile to sometimes stop and think, hey, do I still think that this plan I made three years ago or three months ago or three weeks ago still holds given what I now know? So three minutes for that. Which parts of your plan you know, have just been there for a while, maybe are a little stagnant, could use review? <laughs> 
Something else that can happen with plans that pull them off from being effective is particular attachments or fears that we have. I wouldn't say that all, you know, sometimes things are at stake, like kind of deeply personally with our plans, you know, particular kinds of people we want to be, other people we want to be around, places we want to be, types of work we want to do. I think these are all legitimate things to factor into your plans and where you will be most effective, but it's important to note them. And that's what this exercise is for. If you can, within two minutes, search around in your mind and you say, which part of my plan am I really clinging to? Which one would be like painful to update on that like, hey, this isn't what I should do? Last one. We're all here because as humans, we have this fantastic ability to think about our own. We have this fantastic ability to think about our own thinking and find ways to make it better. This is what this is all about. So this final exercise. Did we miss perverse instantiation? We did miss perverse instantiation. Um, I had a bit of a feeling that we were just running a bit long. Uh, it is a fun one, and I think the instruction is in there for anyone who wants to do it. Sorry, I forgot you guys all had the slides. So let me do that. <laughs> so yeah, reflecting on your own cognition, asking how am I actually making my decisions and choices? And so to the extent that you could remember, I like everyone to think, how did I arrive at my plan? Where did it come from? What process did I use? Would I, if I could, copy this process to the, into the heads of everyone else at EAG? Would that result in good plans getting made? This can, can be, this, this, is, this can be great, because if you find an easy way to improve your cognition, boom, you're now a better thinker. So get at it. Reflect on how did you arrive at your plans currently. I hope these exercises were helpful. I apologize if we moved too quickly and there wasn't enough explanation or time. Um, this is why we, we printed out the slides. So people, anyone who likes them can take them and work more on them. If you don't like them, you can burn them or just leave them here. Uh, let's see, yeah. So I hope that kind of these exercises start to demonstrate this idea of being better at getting information and being better at using it. A lot of the checking over your plans is say, let's save time by like making better plans up front with the information we already have to do that. Or saying, okay, here's the part I'm uncertain about or I d like that might fail. Can I just test that part? And these, are, I think, are get you at towards the more efficiency. And this is what we need for alignment in a domain where there was quick feedback. You could be inefficient about it, or you could just take many years and try lots of things. And this is how most of science is progressing. In alignment, we don't have that luxury. I'm less confident that this particular rationality skills are the right ones, but I'm pretty confident there's something here, something that like takes us from the left of this graph towards the right. And I'm pretty excited for EA and the AI safety field to kind of take that on and say, yeah, we need to at least put some of our efforts into thinking about our efforts and how we're using them. If you like this stuff, here are some resources where you can get some more. Uh, the planning framing is my own, but the, the, the skills that I'm like putting onto that, most of that comes from uh, rational a, rationality A to Z by Elias Yudkowsky, known, also known as the sequences. Uh, the Less Wrong team recently made you know, a nice short highlights from the sequences because the actual sequences are pretty long. Uh, we have some copies in those boxes over there for anyone who wants to grab one on their way out. If you're not a fan of Eliezer's style, there's also the Scout Mindset by Julia Galef, which covers many of the same ideas. Uh, we have the CIFAR handbook that was recently reformatted and made into, a, made into nice to post format, and you can find it on Less Wrong. Generally, there's just lots of good stuff on Less Wrong. You might want to check out the library uh, or chat to your friendly local rationalist about what stuff's good to read. Uh, I think we've got, yeah, we've got a few minutes for, for questions, if anyone has questions.